This is episode 47 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, you'll hear about the life of Paul Rosini. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for magic history. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 47. This podcast is quickly becoming like a big tapestry of magic history with various threads connecting together to make one big, giant, colorful blanket. Uh, My subject today is Paul Rosini, and the first time I mentioned him here on the podcast was episode 21, which was about the Zanzigs, and I'm confident that today will not be the last time you hear me mention Paul Rosini's name. In fact, while I was trying to decide on who to cover this week, I had three names in mind. Paul was one, and the other two, as strange as it is, figure prominently in today's story. I'll mention them uh, a little bit later at the proper moment. So let's get into Paul Rosini. Uh, Paul was born in a town called Trieste, which is in modern-day Italy. Uh, Many of the biographical articles that I could find on Paul do not give the country, uh, only the city of Trieste. And this is due to the fact that it's a port city right on the border of Slovenia and very near Croatia. And this area was also once Austria. And when Paul was born, it was considered Austria. He was born September 29th, 1902, so for perspective, he was a year younger than Slidini. The family name was Vucic, so he was Paul Vucic. The name was actually mistakenly printed in Magic magazines as Vucci, and the discovery of the correct name was made by author and historian Chuck Romano. Paul's father did a little bit of magic, so that's likely where he first got his... uh, his first initial exposure to the art. There was also a local magician named Antonio Molini who Paul saw in his youth. And between these two people, Molini and his dad, uh, it was enough for young Paul to want to become a magician himself. In 1912, the family immigrated from Europe to Chicago. One of the first things that Paul encountered in Chicago was the Roderberg Magic Company run by Gus Roderberg. August Gus Rodeberg was born in 1867 in Hamburg, Germany. He immigrated to the United States in 1882. He was one of the busiest magic shops in America, which was located in Chicago. Uh, The shop had several locations over the years, and this particular one was in the lobby of the Palmer Hotel. The shop and owner were favorites of Houdini who worked with Rodeberg to sell his Defiance Handcuff Act. Rodeberg was also known to supply Houdini with keys for new cuffs. Paul couldn't afford such things, so with his meager earnings, he purchased books. The book House of Cards, The Life and Magic of Paul Rosini by Chuck Romano, which is a biography of Paul Rosini, points out the fact that Rosini loved to read about the lives of magicians. In fact, my friend Danny Haney once told me that Paul Rosini said he learned more from reading the biographies of famous magicians than he ever did reading a book on magic tricks. And I am of the same opinion. The November 1938 edition of the Sphinx magazine has Paul on the cover. In the short article on him, they mention that in his youth, he dreamed of floating ladies in the air and doing all the big illusions. But as it turned out, his future fame was based mainly upon sleight of hand. His big break happened when his family moved to New York City. He soon met Julius Zanzig. Julius and Agnes Zanzig presented an act called Two Minds with But a Single Thought. They were likely the premier mind-reading duo in America. However, in 1916, Agnes passed away. Julius had been looking for a replacement, and he chose his son. Uh, Except he didn't have a son. The son in question was Paul, who was referred to as the son in the act. Paul only stayed with Zanzig for about a year. Uh, Episode 21 of the podcast has more on the Zanzigs, if you want to check that out. 
1918, according to the book House of Cards by Chuck Romano, Paul Vucic goes to work for an illusionist by the name of Carl Rosini. Rosini was a well-established performer who did illusions and stage magic. However, Paul wasn't in his employ for long. In January 1919, Paul met Theodore Bamberg. Theo was running a magic shop at the time, and David became a frequent visitor. In the November 1948 issue of The Linking Ring, there is an article by Theo Bamberg discussing his friendship with Paul. He mentions that he introduced him to Harry Keller and many other prominent magicians of the time. Everyone took a liking to Paul because of how serious a student of magic he was. Paul begged Theo to teach him his cups and balls routine, which Theo actually did. Years later, when Paul was a professional, he was still using the cups and balls and as a matter of fact, Theo had the opportunity to see Paul perform the cups and balls for lay people, and he was overjoyed that so much of the original routine was still in the performance, though, he points out, it was done in a pure Rosini style. Theo goes on to say that in the article, he considered Paul like another son, just like his own son David. At one point, Paul even begins to call Theo Pop, so the feeling must have been mutual. In the summer of 1919, because World War I was over, Theo went back on the road, and he went to South America on tour, along with Carl Rosini. In the article in The Linking Ring, Theo says it was 27 years before he'd see his friend Paul again, so we know Paul did not follow them to South America. The article in The Linking Ring is kind of revealing because Theo Bamberg says, nothing about introducing Paul to Julius Zanzig or introducing him to Carl Rosini. And I think the reason for this is he didn't do it. He didn't introduce him. This is contrary to what um, some of the biographies and uh, articles say. A lot of them assume that Theo made these introductions between Zanzig and Paul and Rosini and Paul, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Theo says he met Paul in January of 1919. So this was after both of those other introductions would have been made. Who made the introductions? Simply not known. What we do know is sometime around 1922 or 23, Paul Vucic becomes Paul Rosini. We also know that Paul did not ask permission to use the name, and we also know that Carl was less than happy about it. In fact, Carl sued Paul to keep him from using the name in New York. And for the record, Carl Rosini remained bitter his entire life. Paul worked for other magicians as well. In 1923, he worked for Grover George. George was an interesting fellow. He wanted to be a big-time touring illusionist. But Howard Thurston, who was the big-time touring illusionist, Uh, kind of put a kibosh on uh, George's ability to perform in the States. So George was relegated to performing in South America. In 1924, George took his show to Cuba and beyond, but without Paul Rosini. Paul seemed to have a shelf life of about a year or less with these other performers. And speaking of the other performers that Paul worked with or for, these include George Marquise, Mysterious Smith, Spencer the Mind Reader, and Martin Sunshine, who was also a mind reader. And there were those he became friendly with, like Theo Bamberg, Joe Berg, Nate Leipzig, who Paul considered his mentor, Di Vernon, Jack Shannon, Milborn Christopher, John Booth, Harry Blackstone Sr., and Mike Cantor. In 1928, in ailing health, Julius Zanzig once again got in touch with Rosini and asked if he and his wife would like to join the act. Paul looked upon it as a steady paycheck because he was now, well, he now had three mouths to feed besides his own. His, that would be his wife and two sons, one who was just born. The deal with Zanzig lasted, you guessed it, about a year. But this time, not because of any fault of Paul's. Julius and his wife Ada decided to move west to California to see if the different climate would help with his health. It did not. Julius Zanzig died July 27, 1929. Paul Rosini and his wife carried on the Zanzig tradition, however, and even took his catchphrase, two minds with but a single thought. 
There's a cute story of the last Zanzig days that comes from the pages of Hugard's Magic Monthly. Apparently, besides doing shows, Zanzig and Paul uh, had hired a new chap uh, to help with the readings. These were astrological readings. And business was very, very busy, so this is why they brought a new person on. Well, according to the article, one afternoon, Paul gave five readings. Zanzig, ten readings. And the new chap gave one. And Zanzig was infuriated. Well, until the new guy showed the stack of dollars his single session had produced. Three hundred dollars. If I might backtrack slightly, Paul did have an act of his own during this time, though he seemed to have been more suited to that of assistant to an established magician. This perhaps because it was more of a regular paycheck. The thing I found interesting is that Paul included in his act the subtrunk or metamorphosis, an escape from a coffin, and something he called spirit mediums outdone, which could have been some sort of spirit cabinet. This is a fairly large show, but that would change in the 1930s. Paul Vucic, or Paul Rosini, saw magic not as a mere novelty, but as a true art form. He studied it religiously and garnered knowledge from everyone he could. He also had his heroes. Chief among them were Charles Bertram and Max Malini. Here were two individuals who were almost the exact opposite of each other, yet performed for very similar audiences. Bertram was educated and refined. Malini was gruff and streetwise. Paul, from reading the book Isn't It Wonderful about Charles Bertram, fell in love with his style of elegant magic. Equally, hearing and reading the stories of Max Malini's exploits, it wasn't hard for Paul to find another connection to this magician. These two men were stand-up performers who conjured with regular items, coins, cards, balls, and the like. When Malini would do his cups and balls routine, he was known to borrow three drinking glasses and wrap them in newspaper. The balls might be pieces of cork cut from the cork of a wine bottle. And yet he would astound his clientele. And for both Malini and Bertram, their clientele tended to be wealthy, rich, often royalty. By the way, Malini and Bertram were the other two names that I considered covering this week in a podcast. Just odd that the three choices I had all had a connection. Paul loved their style and their approach to magic. As he gained knowledge over the years, he added routines to his repertoire that would work in these various venues. So much was similar to the material of Bertram's and Malini's show. Where Bertram was sophisticated and Malini was shocking with his sometimes abrasive yet amazing style, Paul Rosini had something they did not. He had charisma and charm. He also had good looks and impeccable style. He borrowed from them as he could, in some cases taking their patter and adding his own comedic bravado. He created a show that was soon to become the must-see show in magic. At this time, Paul was living in Philadelphia. He became fast friends with the shop owner, Mike Cantor. Mike introduced Paul to a Philadelphia theatrical agent who started to book Paul Rosini in hotels around the city. Finally, Paul got to show what he could do. No longer standing in the wings or standing in the background, now he was out front and center on his own and doing the magic he wanted to do and doing that magic with a flair rarely seen at that time or even since. His charming personality made audiences fall in love with his show. Have you ever heard the old adage, it's not what you do, it's how you do it? Well, you can actually take that a step further and say it's not the tricks, it's never the tricks. It's you. You are what the audiences come back to see. The tricks are important, but your personality needs to be the thing that really shines. And Paul's magic was incredible. So imagine just how bright his personality shined forth. Then we have an event. Not just any event. We have October 29, 1929, the big stock market crash that ushered in the Great Depression. Given our own global events recently, it might not seem like such a thing, but the Great Depression was devastating. And yet, despite soup lines, despite massive unemployment, despite all sorts of hardships, entertainers seemed to have an edge. Not all, but some. 
I remember hearing that Will Rogers, the cowboy comedian, excelled during the Great Depression. And so did Paul Rosini. Great Depression wasn't so great for Paul, in, in as far as being a depression. And given what were really many struggling years, he was due for some personal success. The 1930s were good to Rosini. For one thing, the magic world as a whole took notice of him. The Society of American Magicians and the International Brotherhood of Magicians booked him to work their conventions. Rosini often visited groups when he could, smaller groups, I should say. His real-world bookings began to explode. Suddenly, he was working the top hotels and nightclubs all over the U.S. His act included magic, card tricks, and then his mind reading. Thank you, Mr. Zanzig. But his sleight of hand was really what was drawing in the crowds. That, and as I mentioned before, his style. And yet, despite his success, a major crisis took place. He got divorced and left his wife and two sons. The book House of Cards says that Paul's mother would often watch the boys when he and his wife were on the road, but at some point she said she was no longer going to watch them. I can only imagine the turmoil that must have ensued. The breadwinner of the family was an entertainer, and a traveling one at that. And to support the family, he needed to be on the road. And we're not privy to those conversations or arguments or fights that took place. But it's always a tragedy when a family's broken apart. And I wonder if there wasn't more to the breakup than just the situation of who would watch the kids. Paul continued on. His showbiz career did not slow down one bit, in fact. Most of the venues he was playing were so happy with Paul that he was often held over. These were swanky places, too, with sophisticated audiences, and they loved Paul Rosini. Here's a great quote from magician John Mulholland about Rosini. The only difference between Paul Rosini as a stage magician and Paul Rosini among his intimates is that one time he gets paid for talking and doing magic, and the other time he does it just for the love of it. Robert Parrish said of Rosini, he took many effects which were unimpressive in other hands and made masterpieces out of them. Most of his card favorites were tricks that other magicians had overlooked. Among the important magicians, how at one time or another have revived the vanishing birdcage, Paul is distinguished as the first to do a one-handed disappearance. In addition, he wrote, when Paul Rosini played a return engagement in the famous Empire Room of the Palmer Hotel in Chicago some ten years ago, he was billed as the world's greatest magician. Such a hackneyed billing was not used by this conservative room without reason. Rosini could carry it with aplomb, and he did so for 28 consecutive weeks, setting a record at that room. Rufus Steele said of Rosini, Paul Rosini was essentially a showman rather than an inventor of tricks. He knew how to select good tricks which proper showmanship could make great. And he had a knack for redressing these tricks so that they became more effective. The tricks which he used in his floor show performances were among the oldest in magic. Their effectiveness was due to his personality, his humor, and his clever use of music and various touches to build them up. John Braun said of Rosini, Shy and unassuming offstage, on stage he was an actor gifted with a rare sense of the comic. The character he played was that of a delightful mountebank, at once disreputable and elegant, waggish yet serious. All his art was utilized in building into miracles the tricks he presented. And they were old tricks. Nothing new or complicated, just the old tricks. The egg bag the thumb tie, the card and cigarette, the stabbing trick, the cups and balls, the vanishing birdcage, the bill and lemon, everywhere and nowhere, various card locations, but he could hold a noisy nightclub audience in suspense while he paused, looking quizzically at the pack and slowly turning over a card. I can just picture my old friend Danny Haney smiling from heaven over that last paragraph. Man, he would love that. Magic periodicals are great with tricks and recording happy details of a performer's life, but they're not so good 
with getting to the meat of who a person is. It's just not their purpose. To find out who Paul Ruzzini was off stage, it would require talking to people who knew him. Thankfully, the book House of Cards sheds some light on this side of his life. At some point in the 1930s, Ruzzini became an alcoholic. He drank a lot. He smoked a lot. He spent a lot. And because of his good looks and debonair demeanor on stage, he messed around a lot. He had gotten married a second time, but this didn't curtail his extramarital excursions. He was a flawed human being who had an exceptional skill at magic. It should be noted that his contemporaries all agreed he never performed intoxicated, or if he did, you couldn't tell because, well, his magic was consistently flawless. Over time, though, as the 1940s came about, his physical appearance changed. He lost weight, the color of his skin became more pale, his manner of dress was not quite as immaculate as it had once been. Rosini was still busy performing in hotels across the country. However, on September 19, 1948, all of his drinking caught up to him. He passed away at the New Lawrence Hotel in Chicago. He died from cirrhosis of the liver. He was only 45 years old. As I mentioned earlier, Slidini was one year older, and he lived into the 1990s. Rosini didn't even make it to the 1950s though his name would continue to live on in the pages of many magic periodicals pretty regularly for the next 30 years. Paul Rosini was buried in Elmwood Memorial Park, River Grove, Illinois. Ironically, Carl Rosini retired from performing in 1948, the very same year that Paul Rosini died. Al Sharp wrote something about Paul Rosini that I'd like to finish with. It goes like this. I'm sitting warm and comfortable in my apartment as I pen this page of news. Outside the window, the snow falls, while the wind blows softly but cold. Only a few minutes ago, hatless and with my collar upturned, I stood amongst the falling snowflakes and reminisced of a precious memory of earlier days. As I stood alone, looking into the rubble and bulk of what had once been a landmark of the city, Tears came to the surface, and I, I cried unashamed, for before me was the shattered and battered 885 Club on Rush Street, once the home of Paul Rosini and his magic. Yes, another memory of this great artist was being torn away. Paul loved the 885 Club, and on more than one occasion he became nostalgic when we mentioned it in our conversations. Now the place was being torn down to make way for a modern parking lot. As I stood there in silence, I, I heard a sound within. A voice of the past spoke out mockingly, A tiny little waltz, please. And I peered closer into the darkness and clearly saw Paul again as he walked out onto the floor. There he stood, his hair shining in the spotlight, and then... With all his care and quiet, courtly humor, he began to practice his magnificent art. Almost immediately, the lights dimmed. The voices and shadows vanished. And I was left alone with only a memory of a great artist. I'd like to add, if you're interested in learning more about Paul Rosini, Please pick up the book, House of Cards, The Life and Magic of Paul Rosini by Chuck Romano. It is a fantastic book. I did my best to avoid using this book in the uh, as a source in this podcast, but as you could tell, I, I was forced to use it on occasion. Um, I opted instead to use a lot of Ask Alexander. Uh, there's just so much in the um, House of Cards book that I, I just, just simply did not want to copy, but... It's a wonderful book, and I encourage you to get it because here's the deal. It's the life and magic of Paul Rosini. So half the book talks about his life. The other half is all of his magic, and that is fantastic. I know the book is still out there. It's probably out of print, but it's it's available. I've seen it online. So check it out. It's called House of Cards, The Life and Magic of Paul Rosini by Chuck Romano. You will be thrilled that you got it. So, I suppose I should mention the big global event, or at least the event in the U.S., the massive 
forced unemployment of the entire entertainment community. Well, we're not the only ones that are affected. Um, the big virus going on, the coronavirus. And I really feel for anybody that's out of work right now, I'm personally saddened to see how some people have panicked over this. Other countries are looking at us and asking, why are you out of toilet paper? The virus has nothing to do with that. Yeah, I agree. Let me say this. My opinion and my thoughts. If you're one of those people, like me, out of work, use this time productively. Don't panic. Don't freak out. Take the time and do some needed things. Maybe fix some props or write new material for your show. Maybe write a whole new show. Or um, in my case, here's what I'm doing. I'm brushing up on some advanced coin magic. Um, that I, I'm loving it. I just uh, haven't messed with that stuff in years, and I'm really having a great time doing that. I'm also working on mentalism, reading some, uh, getting really a deep dive into the world of mentalism, which is uh, fascinating to me. And I'm finishing up a magic play that I started to write more than 10 years ago, which I probably will tell you more about next month. So needless to say, I'm as busy as ever with magic stuff, just not performing. And once this is over, trust me, I'll be performing more than ever before because that's what we do. And when I say we, I mean magicians. We adapt and we move forward. I know some are going to fall away. It happens in events like this. And trust me, no one will think less of you for doing so. I just hope that no one in our community dies from this virus. I hope we all come out healthy and safe and ready to conquer the world. When this is over with, the world is going to need us. We're going to need to restore some magic to this wonderful world of ours. Thank you, my friends, for listening to the Magic Detective Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like it, which means find whatever like feature is on your uh, listening device and click it. If you're listening on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please consider giving me five stars and a review. There is a method behind that madness, in case you're wondering, and maybe I'll, I'll explain it another time. But until next time, I'm Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Be well and stay safe.